Chapter 19 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. 19. The Daredevil Barber. To roll over Niagara Falls in a barrel is an odd way of courting death but it seems that death must be courted somehow danger is more attractive to many men than drink they prefer gambling with their lives to gambling with their money they have the gambler's faith in their lucky star they are preoccupied with the vision of victory to the exclusion of all timid thoughts they have a dramatic sense that sets them anticipatorily on a stage bowing to the applause of the multitude it is the applause i fancy rather than the peril itself that entices them the average boy who performs a deed of daring do performs it before his admiring fellows even in so small a thing as ringing a bell and running away he likes to have spectators few boys ring bells out of mischief when they are alone poor mr charles stevens the daredevil barber of bristol who lost his life at niagara falls in his six-foot barrel the other sunday made sure that there would be plenty of witnesses of his adventure not only had he a party of sightseers in motors along the road following the cask on its perilous voyage but he had a cinematograph photographer ready to immortalize the affair on a film two other persons it is said had already accomplished a similar feat one of them a woman was just about gone according to a witness when we got her out of the barrel the other was a used-up man for several weeks this however did not deter the daredevil barber had he not already on one occasion put his head into a lion's mouth had he not boxed in a lion's den had he not stood up to men with rifles who shot lumps of sugar from his head it may seem an extraordinary way to behave in a world in which there are so many reasonable opportunities for heroism but men are extraordinary creatures there is no adventure so wild that they will not embark on it there are men who if they took it into their heads that there was one chance in a hundred of reaching the moon by being precipitated into space in some kind of torpedo would volunteer for the adventure they do these mad things alike for trivial and noble ends they love a stunt even or especially at the risk of their lives half the airplane accidents are due to the fact that many men prefer risk to safety to do some things that other people cannot do seems to them the only way of justifying their existence it is an initiation into aristocracy every man is the rival of all other men and he is not satisfied till he has beaten them if he is a great cricketer or a great poet or a cabinet minister or wins the derby his ambition as a rule is fulfilled and he does not feel the need of jumping down etna or hanging by his toes from the eiffel tower in order to create a sensation but if a man is no use at either poetry or football he must do something blondin became a world-famous figure simply by walking along a tightrope along which neither shakespeare nor shelley could have walked it may be that they would have had no desire to walk along it but in any case blondin was able to feel that he could beat the greatest of men in at least one game in his own business he stood above the apostle paul and michelangelo and napoleon he was a king and even if you did not envy him his trade you had to envy him his throne he was a man you would have liked to meet at dinner not for the sake of his conversation but for the sake of his uniqueness one remembers how one stood with heart and mouth as he set out with his balancing pole in his hand on his journey across the rope blindfolded and pretending to stumble every ten yards a single false step and he would have fallen from the height of a tower to certain death for there was no net to catch him strange that one should have cared whether he fell or not but ninety-nine out of a hundred did care we watched him as breathlessly as though he were carrying the future of the world in his hands he knew that he was interesting us engrossing us and that was his reward it was a reward no doubt that could be measured in gold but it is more than greed of gold that sets men courting death in such ways the joy of being unique is at least as great as the joy of being rich 
and the surest way of becoming unique is to trail one's coat in the presence of death and challenge him to tread on the tail of it not that even the most daring seeker after uniqueness fails to take numerous precautions for his safety no man is mad enough to set out along a tightrope in hobnail boots without previous practice no woman who has not learned to swim has ever tried to swim the english channel from dover to cape grinez even the daredevil barber of bristol insured himself so far as he could against the perils of his adventure he had an oxygen tank in the barrel which would have kept him alive for a time if the barrel had not been swept under the falls and he had friends patrolling the waters to recover the barrel like the schoolboy who takes risks he did not feel that he was going to get caught i have the greatest confidence he said that i shall come through all right his previous escapes must have given him the assurance that he was not born to die of danger not only had he served through the war but he had once plucked a woman from the railway line when the express was so near that it tore her skirt he must have felt that one man at least could live in perfect safety in the kingdom of danger he was probably less nervous as he crept into his barrel than a schoolgirl would be in getting into a boat on the chute he had we may be sure his thrill but was it the thrill of being in peril or the thrill of being conspicuous some men of course there are who love danger for danger's sake and who would run risks in an empty world men of this kind make good spies and in their youth good burglars theirs is the desire of the moth for the star or at any rate of the moth that feels it is different from every other moth and can successfully dare the candle flame to play with fire and not be consumed is a universal pleasure the child passes its fingers through the gas flame and glories in the sensation it is like playing a game of touch with danger the triumph of escape gives one a delicious moment that is why many men invent dangers for themselves it is simply for the pleasure of escaping them there are boys who enjoy wrenching knockers off doors not because knockers are an interesting kind of bric-a-brac but because there is just a chance of being caught in the act by the police i once knew a youth who had a drawer filled with knockers he felt as proud of them as a young indian would have been of an equal number of the scalps of his enemies they proved that he was a brave every man would like to be a brave though every man dare not i confess i never had much ambition to wrench knockers but that may have been because i was perfectly content with the world as it is without making it any more dangerous i often think that people who put their heads into lions mouths do not realize what a dangerous place the planet is without any artificial stimulus did the daredevil barber of bristol ever realize i wonder the danger he was in every time he raised a fork with a piece of roast beef to his lips either the beef might have choked him or it might have given him ptomaine poisoning or if it failed of either of these there are at least half a dozen fatal diseases which vegetarians say are caused by eating it even if we take for granted that there is little danger in plain beef are there not curries and sausages and pork pies on which a lover of risks may exercise his daring in the restaurants i know people who are afraid to eat fish on a monday lest it may have gone bad over the weekend others live in terror of mackerel and herrings i myself have always admired the gallantry of londoners who go into a chance restaurant and order lobsters or curried prawns then there are all the tinned foods a spoil for heroes i have known a v c who was frightened of tinned salmon and a man's food is not more beset with peril than his drink even if he confines himself to water he is in danger at every sip if the water is too hard it may deposit destruction in his arteries if it is too soft it may give his child rickets or it may be populous with germs and give him typhoid fever if on the other hand he is dissatisfied with the drink of the beasts and takes to beverages the use of which distinguishes men from oxen what a nightmare procession of potential ills lies in wait for him you may read an account of them in any temperance tract the very enumeration of them would drive a weak man to water if water itself were not suspect but alas even to breathe is to put oneself in danger there are more germs in a bus than there are stars in the firmament and one cannot walk along the strand without all sorts of bacilli shooting their little arrows at one at every breath 
if men realized these things truly realized them they would see that there is no need to go to the north pole in order to live dangerously a walk from charing cross to st paul's would then be seen to be as rich in hairbreadth escapes as a voyage to an island of head-hunters the man who lives the most thrilling life i know is a man who rarely stirs beyond his garden every time he is pricked by a thorn or gets a little earth in his fingernail he rushes into the house to bathe his hands in lysol and for days afterwards he keeps feeling his jaw to see whether it is stiffening with the first signs of tetanus he lives in a condition of recurrent alarm he gets more frights in a week than an ordinary traveller could get in a year i have often advised him to give up gardening seeing that he finds it so exciting i have come to the conclusion however that he enjoys those half-hourly rushes to the lysol bottle the desperate game of hide-and-seek with lockjaw he needs no barrel to roll him over niagara in order to gaze into the bright eyes of danger he finds all the danger he wants at the root of the meanest brussels sprout that blows end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind weeds and appreciation a weed says the dictionary is any plant that is useless troublesome noxious or grows where it is not wanted the dictionary also adds colloquially a cigar we may omit for our present purpose the harmless colloquialism but the rest of the definition deserves to be closely examined socrates i imagine could have found a number of pointed questions to put to the dictionary maker he might have begun with two of the commonest weeds the nettle and the dandelion having got his opponent and the opponents of socrates were all of the same mental build as sherlock holmes dr watson eagerly to admit that the nettle was a weed he would at once put the definition to the test the story goes he would say quoting mrs clark nuttall's admirable work wild flowers as they grow that the roman soldiers brought the most venomous of the stinging nettles to england to flagellate themselves with when they were benumbed with the cold of this to them terribly inclement isle it is certain he would add from the same source that physicians at one time employed nettles to sting paralyzed limbs into vigor again also to cure rheumatism in view of all this he would ask does it not follow either that the nettle is not a weed or that your definition of a weed is mistaken and his opponent would be certain to answer it does follow o socrates a second opponent however would rashly take up the argument he would point out that even if the romans had a mistaken notion that nettle stings were useful as a preventative of cold feet and if our superstitious ancestors made use of them to cure rheumatism as our superstitious contemporaries resort to bee stings for the same purpose the nettle was at all times probably useless and is certainly useless to-day socrates would turn to him with a quiet smile and ask when we say that a plant is useless do we mean merely that we as a matter of fact make no use of it or that it would be of no use even if we did make use of it and the reply would leap out undoubtedly the latter o socrates socrates would then remember his mrs nuttall again and refer to an old herbal which claimed that excessive corpulency may be reduced by taking a few nettle seeds daily he would admit that he had never made a trial of this cure as he had no desire to get rid of the corpulency with which the gods had seen fit to endow him he would claim however that the usefulness of the nettle had been proved as an article of diet 
that it was once a favourite vegetable in scotland that it had helped to keep people alive at the time of the irish famine and that even during the recent war it had been recommended as an excellent substitute for spinach may we not put it this way he would ask that you call a nettle useless merely because you yourself do not make use of it it seems that you are right o socrates and would you call an aeroplane useless merely because you yourself have never made use of an aeroplane or a pig useless merely because you yourself do not eat pork there would be a great wagging of heads among the opponents after which a third would pluck up courage to say but surely socrates nettles as we know them to-day are simply noxious plants that fulfil no function but to sting our children socrates would say after a moment's pause that certainly is an argument that deserves serious consideration a weed then is to be condemned you think not for its uselessness but for its noxiousness this would be agreed to then he would pursue his questions you would probably call monkshood a weed seeing that it has been the cause not merely of pain but even of death itself to many children his opponent would grow angry at this and exclaim why i cultivate monkshood in my own garden it is one of the most beautiful of the flowers then there would be some wrangling as to whether ugliness was the test of weeds till socrates would make it clear that this would involve omitting speedwell and the scarlet pimpernel from the list someone else would contend that the essence of a weed was its troublesomeness but socrates would counter this by asking them whether horseradish was not a far more troublesome thing in a garden than foxgloves oh one of the disputants would cry in desperation let us simply say that a weed is any plant that is not wanted in the place where it is growing you would call groundsel a weed in the garden of a man who does not keep a canary but not a weed in the garden of a man who does i would socrates would burst out laughing at this and say it seems to me that a weed is more difficult to define even than justice i think we had better change the subject and talk about the immortality of the soul the only part of the definition of a weed indeed that bears a moment's investigation is contained in the three words colloquially a cigar in my opinion the safest course is to include among weeds all plants that grow wild it is also important to get rid of the notion that weeds are necessarily evil things that should be exterminated like rats i remember some years ago seeing an appalling suggestion that farmers should be compelled by law to clear their land of weeds the writer if i remember correctly even looked forward to the day when a farmer would be fined if a daisy were found growing in one of his fields utilitarianism of this kind terrifies the imagination there are some people who are aghast at the prospect of a world of simplified spelling but a world of simplified spelling would be arcadia itself compared to a world without wild flowers according to certain writers in the times however we are faced with the possibility of a world without wild flowers even if the board of agriculture takes no hand in the business these writers tell us that the reckless plucking of wild flowers has already led to a great diminution in their numbers daffodils grow wild in many parts of england but as soon as they appear hordes of holiday makers rush to the scene and gather them in such numbers as to injure the life of the plants i am not enough of a botanist to know whether it is possible in this way to discourage flowers that grow from bulbs if it is it seems likely enough that with the increasing popularity of country walks there will after a time be no daffodils or orchises left in england 
if one were sure of it one would never pluck a bee orchis again one does not know why one plucks it except that the bee-shaped flower is one of the most exquisite of nature's toys and one is greedy of possessing it children try to catch butterflies for the same reason if it were possible to catch a sunset or a blue sea no doubt we should take them home with us too it may be that art is only the transmuted instinct to seize and make our own all the beautiful things that we see the collector of birds eggs and the painter are both collectors of a beauty that can be known only in hints and fragments the painter is justified by the fact that his borrowings actually add to the number of beautiful things if the collector of eggs and the gatherer of flowers can be shown to be actually antisocial in their greed we cannot be so enthusiastic about them i confess that on these matters i have an open mind for all i know the discussion on wild flowers in the times may be merely a scare at the same time it seems reasonable to believe that if flowers that propagate themselves from seed were all gathered as soon as they appeared there would before long be no flowers left i notice that one suggestion has been made to the effect that flower lovers should provide themselves with seeds and should scatter these in likely places during their country walks i do not like this plotting on nature's behalf besides it might lead to some rather difficult situations if this general seed sowing became a matter of principle for instance i should probably sow daisies on my neighbor's tennis lawn poppies and fumitory in his cornfield and dandelions in his meadow it is not that i am devoted to the dandelion as a flower though it has been praised for its beauty but at a later stage a meadow of a million dandelion clocks seems to me to be one of the most beautiful of spectacles but i would go further than this i should never see a hillside cultivated without going out at night and sowing it with the seeds of gorse and thistle not that i should bear any ill will to the farmer but it is said that the diminution of wasteland with its abundance of gorse and thistles has led to a great diminution in the number of linnets and goldfinches the farmer perhaps can do without linnets and goldfinches but we who make our living in other ways cannot i should sow tares among his wheat if necessary if i believed that tares would tempt a bearded tit or a golden oriole still i cannot easily persuade myself that a society for the protection of weeds is even now necessary i have great faith in weeds if they are given a fair chance i should back them against any cultivated flower or vegetable i know any one who has ever had a garden knows that while it is necessary to work hard to keep the shepherd's purse and the chickweed and the dandelion and the wartwort and the hawkweed and the valerian from growing one has to take no such pains in order to keep the lettuces and the potatoes from growing for myself i should in the vulgar phrase back the shepherd's purse against the lettuces every time if the weeds in the garden fail to make us radiantly happy is it not because they are weeds but because they are the wrong weeds why not the ground ivy instead of the shepherd's purse that lank intruder that not only is a weed but looks like one why not bee orchises for wartwort and gentians for chickweed i have no fault to find with the foxgloves under the apple tree or with the ivy-leaved toad flax that hangs with its elfin flowers from every cranny in the wall but i protest against the dandelions and the superfluity of groundsel i undertake that if rest harrow and scabious and corn cockle invade the garden i shall never use a hoe on them more than this if only the right weeds settled in the garden i should grow no other flowers but shepherd's purse compared with it a cabbage is a posy for a bridesmaid 
and sprouting broccoli a bouquet for a prima donna after all one ought to be allowed to choose the weeds for one's own garden but then when one chooses them one no longer calls them weeds the periwinkle the primrose and the mallow we spare them with our tongue as with our hoe this perhaps suggests the only definition of a weed that is possible a weed is a plant we hoe up or rather that we try to hoe up a flower or a vegetable is a plant that the hoe deliberately misses but in spite of the hoe the weeds have it they survive and multiply like a subject race well perhaps better a weed than a geranium end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Twenty One. A Juror in Waiting. The train was crowded with jurymen. Every one of them was saying something like, It's a disgrace. It's a perfect scandal. No other nation would put up with it. And here we all are grumbling, and what are we going to do about it? Nothing. That's the British way. They were not complaining of any act of injustice perpetrated against a prisoner. They were complaining of their own treatment. Fifty or sixty of them had been summoned from the four ends of the county and kept packed away all day under a gallery at the back of the court where there was not even room for all of them to sit down and where there were certainly not room for all of them to breathe. It would have been an easy thing for the clerk of the court to choose a dozen jurymen in the first ten minutes of the day and dismiss the rest on their business. He might, if necessary, have also picked a reserve jury and selected the jury for the next day's cases. The law revels in expense, however, and so a great number of middle-aged men were taken away for two whole days from their businesses and compelled to sit in filthy air and on benches that would not be endured in the gallery of a theatre with nothing to do but watch the backs of the heads of a continuous procession of barristers and bigamists few jurors would have complained i think if there had been any rational excuse for detaining them what they objected to so bitterly was the fact that no use was made of them and that they were kept there for two days though it must have been obvious to every one that the majority of them might as well be at home it may be however that there is some great purpose underlying the present system of calling together a crowd of unnecessary jurymen perhaps it is a form of compulsory education for middle-aged men it shows them the machine of the law in action and enables them to some extent to say from their own observation whether it is being worked in a fair and humane or in a harsh and vindictive spirit one cannot sit through one criminal case after another at the assizes without gaining a considerable amount of material for forming a judgment on the matter. The juror in waiting, as he sees a pregnant woman swooning in the dock, or a man with a high pumpkin-shaped back to his head, led off down the dark stairs to five years' penal servitude, becomes a keen critic of the British justice that may have been to him, until then, merely a phrase. How does British justice emerge from the test? Well, it may be that this judge was a particularly kind judge, and that the policemen of this county are particularly kindly policemen. But I confess that, much as I detest other people's boasting, I came away with the impression that the boast about British justice is justified. I do not believe that it is by any means always justified in the mouths of statesmen who use it as an excuse for their own injustice, and I would not trust every judge or every jury to give a verdict free from political bias in a case that involved political issues but in the ordinary case as between in the words of the oath our sovereign lord the king and the prisoner at the bar it seems to me if my two days experience can be taken as typical that british justice is not only just but merciful the evidence is perhaps insufficient as in most cases the sentences were deferred but what pleased one was the general lack of vindictiveness in the prosecution or in the police evidence hardly a bigamist climbed into the dock 
and there was an apparently endless stream of them to whom the local police did not give a glowing certificate of character the chief constable of the county went into the witness box to testify that one bigamist was reliable a good worker etc his general conduct a policeman would say of another as regards both the women was good the barristers as was natural dwelt on the army record of most of the men and even when a client had pleaded guilty would appeal to the judge to remember that he had before him a man with a stainless past but wait wait the judge would interrupt you know bigamy is a very serious offence i quite agree with your lordship counsel would reply nervously but i beg of you to take into consideration that the prisoner was carried away by his love for this woman this is where the judge always grew indignant he was a little man with big eyebrows a big nose a big mouth and white whiskers his whiskers made him appear a little like matthew arnold in a wig and scarlet save that he did not look as if he were sitting above the battle you tell me he declared warmly that he loved this woman while he admits that he deceived her into marrying him and falsely described himself in the marriage certificate as a bachelor counsel would again nervously agree with his lordship that his client had done wrong in deceiving the woman but in three sentences he would have found another way round to the portraiture of the prisoner as all but a model for the young certainly the great increase in the offence of bigamy proves at least the hollowness of all the talk about the growing indifference to the marriage tie whatever we may think of bigamists and there are black sheep in every flock the bigamist is manifestly a much married man he is a person i should say with the bump of domesticity excessively developed the merely immoral man as most of us know him does not ask for the sanction of the law for his immorality he does not feel the want of a home from home as the bigamist does the increase in bigamy it seems clear enough is largely due to the war which not only gave men opportunities for travel such as they had never had before but enabled them to travel in a uniform which was itself a passport to many an impressionable female heart men had never been so much admired before never had they had so wide a choice of female acquaintances i am amazed said clive on a famous occasion at my own moderation many a bigamist as he stands in the dock in these days of the cool fit could conscientiously put forward the same plea but the most that any of them can say is that they thought the first wife was dead or that she wanted to bring up the children roman catholics the first wife in one of the bigamy cases went into the witness box and i saw what to me was an incredible sight an Englishwoman of thirty who could neither read nor write red-haired tearful weary she did not even know the months of the year she said a telegram had been sent to her husband saying that she was dangerously ill in february was that this year or last year asked counsel i don't know sir she said come come said the judge you must know whether you are suffering from a dangerous illness this year or last no sir she replied shakily you see sir not being a scholar i couldn't hardly tell sir then a bright idea struck her my hospital papers could tell the date sir she produced from her pocket a paper saying that she had undergone an operation in a hospital in september nineteen nineteen that was all that could be got out of her the counsel on the other side rose to cross-examine her about the dates you had an operation in september you say were you laid up at any other time during the past two years no sir but you have sworn that you were ill in february when a telegram was sent to your husband yes sir and now you say that you weren't ill at any other time except in september no sir so you weren't ill in february oh yes sir i had the flu sir she was as obstinate about it all as the child in we are seven but she kept assuring us that she was no scholar her husband said that he had received a letter saying she was dead and though he had lost it he quoted it at length as far as he could remember it it was a beautiful letter expressing regret that he had not been at the side of the deathbed where the writer was sure whatever faults had been on either side would have been forgiven you never were dead the judge asked the woman no sir she replied in the same tone of we are seven seriousness a girl was put in the dock charged with having stolen a post-office savings bank book a policeman 
giving evidence, said, Until the 6th of December she was in the wax. You say, said the judge, rather bewildered by the good appearance of the girl, that she was in the workhouse? In the wax, my lord. I think he means the Royal Air Force. Prosecuting counsel helped the judge out with his perplexity, and the word raff went from mouth to mouth around the court. The girl was guilty, but the judge told her that he was not going to send her to prison. I don't think it would do you any good, and I don't think the interests of society call for it, he said. What I'm going to do is to bind you over to come up for judgment if called upon. Now go away home and be a good girl, and, if you are, you won't hear anything more about it. You've done a very disgraceful thing, but you can live it down by good conduct in the future. There was another thief, a boy of eighteen, who had been deserted by his mother at the age of three, and whom the judge also told, though not in those words, to go and sin no more. There was also a boy who had forged his father's consent to his marriage, and he and his girl wife were lectured like children and sent home to do better in future. As the judge said to the boy, this is not a thing you are likely to do again. His wife, who was expecting a baby, had to be carried fainting from the dock. Counsel could not bring himself to say that she was expecting a baby. He said that she was in a certain condition. The modesty of the law is marvelous. One of the most interesting of the prisoners was a little sleek-headed man accused of fraud, who kept moving his head about like a tortoise out of its shell. His head was black and shining, where it was not bald and shining. He had gold-rimmed spectacles and a sallow face. He glided his hands over the knobs of the front of the dock with a reptilian smoothness. He had persuaded a number of tradesmen and hotel keepers that he was an English peer. He had even complained to one shopkeeper of the smallness of a wallet, as he needed something larger to hold the title deeds relating to the peerage. In another case, a young man, staying in a house, had stolen, along with other things, his hostess's false teeth, her best dress, and a great quantity of underclothing. A parcel of clothing had been recovered from a second-hand shop and was shown to the lady when in the witness box. She took up one of the garments and fingered it. Well, said the prosecuting counsel encouragingly, is that your best dress? Nah, she said melancholily, that's me apron. Then there was a young man who stole a motor bicycle by presenting a revolver at the head of the owner. He denied that he had stolen it, and maintained that, after he had apologized to the owner for having treated him so abruptly, they had become friendly, and he had been told to take the bicycle away and pay for it later. Alas, there is a limit to human credulity. Besides, the young man had a crooked mouth. After two days in the court, one begins to believe that one can tell an honest man from a liar by looking at him. Probably one is overconfident. End of chapter 21「twenty two of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind chapter twenty two the three halfpenny bit as a rule there is nothing that offends us more than a new kind of money we felt humiliated in the early days of the war when we were no longer paid in heavy little discs of gold and had to accept paper pounds and ten shillingses we even sneered at the design we always sneer at the design of new money or a new stamp but we hated the paper even more than the design we could not believe it had any value we spent it as though it were paper one would as soon have thought of collecting old newspapers as of playing the miser with it. That is probably the true secret of the fall in the value of money. Economists explain it in other ways, but it seems likeliest that paper money lost its value because we did not value it. Shopkeepers took advantage of our foolish innocence, and the tailor demanded sums in paper that he would never have dared to ask in gold. I doubt if the habit of thrift will ever be restored till the gold currency comes back. Gold is the only metal for which human beings have any lasting respect. 
no one but a child would save up pennies there is something in gold the colour perhaps reminding us of the sun the god of our ancestors that puts us into the mood of worshippers the children of israel found it impossible not to worship the golden calf they have gone on worshipping it ever since had the calf been of paper they would i feel confident have remained good christians the influence of hatred on the expenditure of money is seen in our attitude to three penny bits nine out of ten people feel sincerely indignant when a three penny bit is given to them in their change the shopkeeper who gives you two three penny bits instead of a sixpence knows this and as he hands you the money says apologetically do you mind you say not at all but you do you know that they will be a constant misery to you till you get rid of them you know that if you give one of them to a bus conductor even if he is able to restrain himself he will feel like throwing you off the top of the bus when at length you spend one of them in a post office one never has the same scruples about government institutions you hurry out with a guilty air not having dared to look the lady at the counter in the eye in the nineteenth century when people went to church they used to get rid of their threepenny bits at the collection they had once relieved themselves of a nuisance and enjoyed the luxury of flinging the gleam of silver on to the plate many a good baptist has trusted to his threepenny bits being mistaken for a sixpence by the neighbours at least perhaps even by heaven he has a notion that the widow's might is a threepenny bit and feels that his gift is in a great tradition the popular hatred of certain coins however goes back to a far earlier date than the invention of the threepenny bit even gold when it was first introduced into the english coinage was met with such a storm of denunciation that it had to be withdrawn this was in the time of henry the third who issued a gold penny to take the place of the silver penny that had hitherto been the chief english coin it was only in the reign of edward the third that gold coins became established in england they may have helped to recommend themselves to the nation by their intensely anti-french character they bore the french arms and announced that king edward was king of england and france france is a country lying close to the shores of england and is of great strategic importance to her i do not know whether the copper coins which first came into england in the time of charles the second raised any clamour of public protest the nation i fancy was so relieved to get back to cakes and ale that it was not inclined to be censorious about the new half-pennies and farthings in the old days people had made their own half-pennies and farthings by the simple process of cutting pennies into halves and quarters they also issued private coins on the same principle on which we nowadays write cheques municipalities and shopkeepers alike issued these tokens or promises to pay and without them there would not have been sufficient currency for the transaction of business the copper coins of charles the second were intended to put a stop to this unofficial sort of money but towards the end of the eighteenth century there was such a scarcity of copper currency that local shopkeepers and bankers defied the law and again began to issue their own coins i have in my possession what looks like a george the third shilling with the king's head on one side and on the other inside a wreath of shamrocks the inscription bank token ten pence irish eighteen thirteen it was turned up by the plough on a staffordshire farm a few years ago speaking of this reminds me that a separate irish coinage continued even after the union of eighteen hundred it was not till eighteen seventeen that english gold and silver became current in ireland and irish pennies and half pennies were struck as late as the reign of george the fourth the scottish coins came to an end more than a century earlier the name of one of them however the bobby has survived in popular humour some people say that the name is merely a corruption of baby referring to the portrait of queen mary as an infant 
it seems to me as unlikely a derivation as could be imagined of all the english coins the first appearance of which occasioned popular anger none had a worse reception than the two shilling piece which appeared in eighteen forty nine this piece says miss g b rawlings in coins and how to know them a book rich in information was unfavourably received owing to the omission of de gratia after the queen's name it was stigmatized as the godless or graceless florin the florin however so called after a florentine coin had come to stay but since eighteen fifty one it has been as godly in inscription as any of the other money in one's pocket the coin has survived but hardly the name one can with an effort call a spade a spade but who would think of calling a florin a florin the coin itself for a time bore the inscription one florin two shillings as though the name called for translation since the introduction of the florin there have been many coins that arouse popular hatred the four shilling piece especially that was struck in the year of queen victoria's jubilee was received with a howl of execration men went about in constant dread of argument with shopkeepers as to whether they had given a four shilling or a five shilling piece in the interests of the national good temper the coin ceased to be struck after eighteen ninety englishmen however disliked the entire jubilee coinage they disliked the queen's portrait and they disliked especially a sixpence which could be easily gilded to look like a half sovereign the sixpences were hurriedly withdrawn but schoolboys continued to treasure them in the belief that they were worth fabulous sums like groats the delight of one's childhood they began to be desirable as soon as they ceased to be common when king edward the seventh came to the throne there was another outburst of hatred of new money the chief objection to it was the king's effigy had been designed by a german and had not even been designed well it was at this time perhaps when people began to hate the money in their pockets that the reign of modern extravagance began to get rid of a sovereign bearing a design by herr foch seemed a patriotic duty thrift and pro-germanism were indistinguishable much as men detest new sorts of money in their own country however many of us take a childish pleasure on our first arrival in france in handling strange and unfamiliar coins one of the great pleasures of travel is changing one's money there is a certain lavishness about the coinage of the continent that appeals to our curiosity even in getting a five-franc piece we never know whether it will bear the emblem of a republic a kingdom or an empire coins of greece and italy jingle in our pocket with those of the impostor louis napoleon and those of the wicked leopold king of the belgians in switzerland i remember even getting a cretan coin which i was humiliated by being unable to pass at a post office the postal official took down a huge diagram containing pictures of all the european coins he was allowed to accept he studied greek coins and for all i know yugoslav coins but nowhere could he find the image of the coin i had preferred him crete for him did not exist he shook his head solemnly and handed the coin back is there any situation in which a man feels guiltier than when his money is thrust back on him as of no value this happens oftener perhaps in france than in any other country france has the reputation of being the country of bad money the reputation is i believe exaggerated though i have known a boulogne tram conductor to refuse even a fifty centime piece as bad i remember vividly a warning given to me on this subject during my first visit to france i was sitting with a friend in an estaminet in a small village in the north of france when an english chauffeur insinuated himself into the conversation he was eager to give us advice about france and the french i like the french he said but you can't trust them look out for bad money they're terrors for bad money i'd have been done oftener myself only that luckily i married a frenchwoman she's in the ticket office at the maison des delites 
you probably know the name it's a dancing hall in montmartre any time i get a bad five franc piece i pass it on to her and she gets rid of it in the change to some froggy my god they are dishonest i wouldn't say a word against the french but just that one thing they're dishonest damn dishonest he sat back on the bench a figure of insular rectitude but of cosmopolitan broad-mindedness is it not the perfect compromise end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by zachary gorelick the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind chapter twenty three the morals of beans nine bean rows will i have there cries mr yeats in describing his utopia in the lake isle of innisfree i have only two they run east to west between the second early potatoes and the red currant bushes they are broad beans they are in flower just now and every flower is a little black and white butterfly that however is the good side of the account if you look closer at them you will see that each of them appears as if its head had been dipped into coal dust there is a congregation of the blackest of all insects hiding in hard congestion among the leaves and the flowers at the top compared to them the green fly on the roses has almost charm there is something slummy and unwashed looking about the black blight these insects are as foul as a stagnant pond though they have wings they seem incapable of flight they are microbes of a larger growth a disease and a desecration on the other hand there is one good point about them they are very stupid instead of spreading themselves out along the entire extent of the bean and so lessening their peril they mass themselves in hordes in the very tops of the plants as though they had all some passionate taste for rocking in the wind like the baby on the treetop this is what gives the gardener his opportunity he has but to walk along the rows pinching off the top of each plant and filling his flat little basket called i believe a trug with them and lo the beans are safe and produce all the finer and fuller pods as a result of their having been stunted at this point the moral thrusts out its head there are those who believe that beans have no morals to call a man old bean gives him it is said a pleasant feeling that he is something of a dog gilbert again in patience has a reference to a not too french french bean that suggests a ribald estimate of this family of plants the broad bean on the other hand seems to me to exude morality not least when it parts with its head to save its life there is no better preacher in the vegetable garden it is the very chrysostom of the gospel of frustration the gospel that a great loss may be a great gain the gospel that through their repressions men may all the more successfully achieve their ends nor is this gospel confined to the sect of the beans which are by a happy paradox both broad and evangelical the apple trees bear the same message in their unpruned branches unpruned owing to a long absence from home during the winter it is an amazing fact i speak as an amateur but it is an amazing fact if it is a fact that an apple tree if it is left to itself will not grow apples it has an entirely selfish purpose in life its aim is to be a tree living to itself producing a multitude of shoots and leaves it succeeds in living a rich and fruitful life only when the gardener has come with the abhorred shears and lopped its branches till it must feel like a frustrate thing the fruit is the fruit of frustration were it not for this frustration it would ultimately return to a state of wildness and would become a crabbed and barren weed fit only for a perch for birds thus it seems to me the broad bean and the apple tree are persuasive defenders of civilization and of those concomitants of civilization morality and the arts heretics frequently arise both in ethics and in the arts who say no more restraints give the bean its head there are psychoanalysts who appear to regard 
frustrations as the one serious evil in life, and the apostles of Ver Libre denounce meter and rhyme because these merely serve to frustrate the natural impulses of the imagination. As a matter of fact, it is this very frustration that gives poetry much of its depth and vehemence. Great genius expresses itself, not in the freedom of formlessness, but in the limitations of form. Shakespeare's passion turned instinctively to the most frustrative of all poetic forms, that of the sonnet, in order to express itself in perfection. It is, as a rule, those who have nothing to say who wish to say it without the terrible frustrations of form. Obviously, there is a golden mean in the arts, as in all things, and there comes a point at which form passes into formalism. Genius requires just enough frustration to increase its vehemence, and so to transmute nature into art. It is possible that some frustration of a comparable kind is needed in order to transmute nature into morality, and that the man who would, in Milton's phrase, make of his life a poem must submit to commandments as difficult as those of meter or rhyme. It is not merely the Christians and the Stoics who have maintained this. Epicurus himself was a believer in virtue as a means to happiness. This, indeed, is a commonplace written all over the face of nature. There is no great happiness without opposition, except for children. The climber struggles with the hill, the rower with the water, the digger with the earth. They are all men who live on the understanding that the pleasures of difficulty are greater even than the pleasures of ease. The biographies of famous men are prolific of examples that support the theory of frustration. Homer, they say, was blind, and the legend seems to suggest that his blindness, far from injuring, abetted his genius. Tertius, being physically unable to fight, became the poet of fighting and achieved more with his words than did most men with their weapons. Demosthenes, again, was an orator frustrated by many defects. Everyone knows the story of his wretched articulation and how he shut himself up and practiced speaking with pebbles in his mouth in order to overcome it. Few of the great orators, indeed, seem to have succeeded in oratory without difficulty. Neither Cicero nor Burke spoke with the natural ease of many a young man in a YMCA, debating society. And the great writers, like the great orators, have been, in many instances, men doomed in some important respect to lead frustrated lives. Mr. Beerbohm recently said that he has never known a man of genius whose life was not marred by some obvious defect. People have talked for two thousand years of the desirability of men sana in corpore sano, but if everybody possessed this, possessed it from birth and without effort, there would probably soon be a shortage of genius. The sanity of genius is not the sanity of the healthy-minded athlete. It is the sanity of the human spirit struggling against forces that threaten to frustrate it. The greatest love poetry has not been written by men who have found easy happiness in love. Don's poems are the poems of a frustrated lover. Keats's greatest poetry was the fruit of unfulfilled love. Thus, genius turns poverty into riches. Few men of genius are enviable, save in their genius. Beethoven, a frustrate lover and ultimately a deaf musician, is a type of genius at its most sublime. Charles Lamb, as we read the essays, seems at times to be one of the most enviable of men, but that is only because he is supremely lovable. Who knows how much we owe to the defects of his life? Even the impediment in his speech seems to have been one of the conditions of his genius. He tells us that, if he had not stammered, he would probably have been a clergyman, and, if he had been a clergyman, he would hardly have been Elia. His life, too, was that of a tragic bachelor, he whose writings breathed the finest spirit of fireside comedy. There could be no better example of the truth that genius is, as a rule, a response to apparently hostile limitations. On the whole, then, the common-sense attitude to life is not to deplore one's limitations, but to make the best of them. No man need envy another his good fortune too bitterly. Good fortune has wasted as many men as it has assisted. George Wyndham was one of the most fortunate men of his time, strong, handsome, 
an athlete, an orator, a statesman, a writer with a sense of style, popular, rich, and with nine out of ten of the attributes that we envy most. Had achievement come less easily to him, he might have been a greater man. There have been ugly men who have been more enviable. There have been weedy men who are more enviable. There have been poor men who are more enviable. But the truth is, one does not know whom to envy. It is probably wise to envy nobody. It would be foolish, however, to pretend that frustration is a desirable thing in itself, apart from all other considerations. The beans nod their heads to no such gospel. Frustration may easily reach the point of destruction. One might frustrate one's broad beans excessively by pulling them up from the roots or cutting them down to within an inch of the ground. There must still be room left for the life of the plant to find a new outlet. The beans do not preach a sermon against liberty, but only against lawlessness. But, for all I know, they may preach different gospels to different amateur gardeners. Each of us finds in nature what he wishes to find. I confess I myself am prejudiced in favor of sermons of a consoling kind. It is consoling to think that, in a world of defects, a defect often carries with it its own compensation, that strength, as the preachers say, may be made perfect in weakness. But when one looks round and enumerates the miseries of human beings, one wonders how far this is, after all, true, except for men whose gifts are naturally greater than hog, dog, or devil can imperil. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of the Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter Twenty Four On Seeing a Joke. Almost any man can make a joke, but it sometimes requires a clever man to see one. It is said that a Scotsman jokes we difficulty. What we really mean is that it is often difficult to see a Scotsman's jokes, or even to know whether he is joking or being serious. As a matter of fact, the Scots are an unusually humorous race. They make jokes, however, with the long faces of undertakers, and one is sometimes afraid to laugh for fear of appearing frivolous on a solemn occasion. I have in mind one brilliant Scottish professor who, whether he is jocular or serious, invariably monologizes in the tones of a man condoling with a widow. He half shuts his eyes and folds his hands, and for the first minute or two takes an evil delight in leaving you in doubt whether he is launching into a tragic narrative or whether he was suddenly look up through his spectacles and expect to see you laughing. His English friends are in a constant state of embarrassment because they know that he is a humorist of genius. But his humor is so subtle that they do not trust themselves to see the point when it comes and laugh at the right place. Now there are only two things that can make the professor look sterner than he looks while giving birth to a joke. One is if you laugh too early. The other is if the great moment comes and you don't laugh at all. He makes no complaint, but he sits back in his chair looking like an embittered owl. And everybody else in the room has a sense of ghastly failure. His own failure, not the professor's. To miss seeing a joke is, in some circumstances, far worse than to miss making the point of a joke visible. If one were in the position of a Queen Victoria, one might, of course, quench the professor by merely saying, We are not amused. But even Queen Victoria, when she said this, did not mean that she had not seen the joke, but that she had seen it and didn't like it. It is not only the subtle and Scottish jokes, however, that are at times difficult to see with the naked eye. There is also the joke that hits you in the eye like a blow and blinds you. Captain Wedgwood Ben referred to a joke of this kind in the House of Commons on the authority of Mr. Stephen Gwynne. A judge of the Irish High Court, he related, was recently travelling on a tram which was held up by black and tans. The black and tans, who, like the most high, are no respecters of persons, called on the judge to descend, 
using the quaint colloquial formula come down you irish bastard put up your hands captain wedgwood ben does not unfortunately possess a twentieth century sense of humour and he did not see this particular joke the comedy of a judge's being addressed as an irish bastard did not strike him i doubt if half a dozen members of the house of commons realized the beauty of the joke till sir hamar greenwood got up and explained it i happen to know the judge said the twinkling chief secretary he told the story himself with great glee and here it is mr justice wiley the last and one of the best judges appointed in ireland was riding on a tram car to a hunting meet when he got to the end of his ride there were some policemen on duty and they did use a word which i trust no honourable member of this house will ever use in calling him down from the tram they did him no harm he treated it as a joke and he would be the man most surprised to find it quoted in the house and in the observer as an example of the decadence of the irish police i agree with sir hamar a joke is a joke and many irishmen unlike mr justice wiley are unduly thin-skinned the only criticism i would make on sir hamar greenwood's idea of a joke is that he appears to suggest that it would have been less funny if the black and tans had done the judge some harm i should have expected him rather to dilate on the attractions of life in the irish police force for men with a sense of humour suppose the judge had been robbed of his watch or had had his front teeth broken with the muzzle of a revolver like the university professor at cork would not that have made the incident still funnier suppose he had been carried round as a hostage on a motor lorry or shot with a bucket over his head as has happened to other innocent men would it not have been a theme for Aristophanes, who got so much fun out of the idea of one person's being beaten in mistake for another i am confident that distinguished englishmen will behave in the spirit of mr justice wiley when there is an outbreak of humour among the english police mr justice darling will no doubt enjoy himself hugely on the day on which an armed policeman first holds up his motor-car and addresses him hallo you blasted old bolshevik come off the perch and quick about it and put up the idden and there are some judges who would complain to the home office if such a thing happened to them mr justice darling however has a keen sense of humour i feel certain that on arriving in court after his experiences he would tell the story with great glee he would turn up his face sideways as he does when he is amused and say to the jury a most amusing thing happened to me this morning by the way there is no end indeed to the directions in which a police force saturated with the grinwoodian sense of fun might add to the gaiety of nations they might arm themselves with squirts and laughing cabinet ministers would have to duck as they pass down the white hall in order to avoid a drenching pluffing peas at the bishops on their way to the house of lords would also be good sport so long as they did not really hurt any of them to bash the lord chancellor's hat over his eyes would be going too far as it involves a money loss but a harmless blow on the crown with a bladder would be rather amusing it would also be amusing if a number of policemen were told off to greet mr lloyd george with cries of welch attorney and to chaff him with genial scurrilities on his arrival at the house if these things happened there are killjoys i know who would immediately set up a clamour for the restoration of discipline in the police force mr lloyd george however has always been a man who can not only make a joke but take one and i am sure that he at least would defend the democratic right of the policeman to a bit of chaff nor would i confine the right of chaff to the police force i would make it universal i should like to see it introduced into the church itself even the dullest sermon would become entertaining if the verger had the right and the habit of interpolating such remarks as cheese it pussyfoot or ring off you bleedin old boar ring off there has been too little of this sort of popular raillery in recent years the bus drivers used to be the past masters at it poking their quiet fun impartially at their fellow drivers and ordinary citizens whether it is that the drivers of motor-buses realize that no joke could be heard above the din 
or whether it is that they feel as ill-tempered as they look, their arrival has made fatal inroads on the geniality of London. An artist with uncut hair can still awaken a spark of the old wit if he goes down a back street, and a woman and children will revive for his benefit the venerable witticism, "'Get your hair cut!' But generally speaking, there has been a notable decline in the humours of insult within living memory. The Germans, always fond of a joke, made an effort to revive it during the war. It was a common thing for them, we are told, on capturing a prisoner, to address him as Schweinhund, or Verdammt Engländer, or by some other good-humoured phrase of the same kind. I regret to say that some Englishmen were so deficient in the sense of humour that, Instead of taking this in the spirit in which it was offered, they bitterly resented it. I cannot indeed recall a single instance of an Englishman who properly appreciated the joke of being called a Schweinhund by a man he had never seen before. You will seek in vain throughout the literature of prisoners of war for a returned soldier who tells the story of the names he was called with the glee that it deserves and yet no doubt the Germans enjoyed the joke thoroughly, and would have been surprised to find it quoted in the observer as an example of the decadence of the German army. Perhaps, however, the Schweinhund joke does not afford an entirely fair comparison. It is a simple joke, whereas the Greenwood joke, there are two elements. There is the element of insult, and there is the element of mistaken identity. It is not merely that somebody or other was called you Irish bastard, but that the wrong person was called you Irish bastard. Thus, if a policeman addressed a woman in Oxford Street in the words, Op it, you old bitch! It would only be mildly funny if the woman were a poor woman. But it would be immensely funny if she turned out to be a marchioness. The marchioness, no doubt, would be enchanted, and would tell the story with great glee. If she were a sentimentalist, she might say to herself, Is this really the way in which ordinary human beings are treated by the police? This is a hideous state of affairs in which bullies in uniform are allowed to address foul insults to whom they please. Thank heaven it's happened to someone like me. Now I can tell the Home Secretary, and he will put an end to the whole system. One never knows what a modern Home Secretary might do, but I doubt if one could be found who would reply to the Marchioness, Well, he did you no harm. You know, to me, it all seems rather funny. And yet most things have their funny side if you look on them in the right spirit. It would have been a funny thing if the hangman had executed the wrong prisoner instead of Crippen. The hanged man would not have seen the joke, but impartial onlookers would have seen it, and Crippen would have seen it. Similarly, if a drunken man threw a brick at his wife and hit the missionary by mistake, who could help but laughing? Even the wife, if she had a sense of humour, would have to join in. Oversensitive souls, such as Shelley was, might view the incident with pain and mourn over a world in which human beings treated each other in such a way. But life is a hard school, and it is not well to be oversensitive. After all, if we all became angels, there would be no jokes left. We should have no clowns in the music halls, no comic boxing turns with glorious thumpings on unexpecting noses. Heaven is a place without laughter, because there is no cruelty in it, no insults, and no accidents. As for us, we are children of earth, and may as well enjoy the advantages of our position. So let us laugh, ha-ha, let us laugh, ho-ho, the world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. And never was it so full of a number of things as since a coalition government came into power. Queer, delightful things, for instance, like policemen who call judges bastards, as who should say, cheerio, old thing. Our grandfathers would not have seen that joke. This is one of the things that convince me of the reality of progress. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Washington, Atlanta 
The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind Chapter 25 Going to the Derby Do they have as much fun at the Derby as they used to? I heard an old gentleman in a white hat, canary gloves, and button boots ask a fellow passenger in a London train. Fun? No, one would hardly call it that. Looking back on it after forty years, one would no doubt call it fun, but it is certainly not fun while it lasts. The two most important features of the Derby are getting there and getting away again. Getting there is harder work than bricklaying or journalism. You may ride in a motor car, but your motor will be as useless to you as a submarine in a swimming bath. From Sutton to Epsom, and from Epsom to the Downs, a long procession of motor cars, buses, wagonettes, green grocers' carts, lorries, school carts, drays, and human beings stretches like a serpent of infinite length, a serpent that is apparently too sick to move. One thinks of it as an old serpent that has made itself very ill by swallowing machinery. Every few minutes it gives the machinery in its inward parts a shake, it makes one more effort to crawl. A queer rattle, shiver, and groan run through it from tip to tail, but the effort is too much for it. It immediately subsides on a lame and impotent stomach, and hour after hour passes with no other diversion except the antics of an occasional nervous horse that rises on his hind legs and waves his forefeet in the back of your neck over the hood of the car. There is a common belief that the crowd that goes to the Derby is a cheerful crowd, that it sings and plays concertinas and changes hats. There could not be a greater delusion. It is as quiet and determined as a procession of men and women going to hear Dr. Horton preaching at Hampstead. Not a song. Well, one song. Not a joke. Well, one joke. When a fat man saw a poor brown lop-eared ass in a field of daisies and called out, There's the winner of the derby. He apparently felt it was a very good joke, for he repeated it to parties on tops of buses and parties on green grocers' carts and parties in furniture vans. The sun, however, was unpropitious for jokes. Even the East Ender, who had worked an edging of red and white wool into its pony's mane and hung rosettes of red, white, and blue at its ears, was too busy perspiring and hating his hundred thousand neighbors to smile. He was also weighing his chances of getting to Epsom Downs before Judgment Day. I admired his spirit in waving the whip with a knot of colored ribbons. There was a little other color to be seen. We were a procession of victims red as beef steaming like the window of a fried fish shop dusty swollen vein and we could only sink back helpless and gasping in the grip of the monstrous possession of will things that advanced more slowly than any snail that was ever known on this side of the ural mountains i doubt if that procession ever reached epsom downs i did so only because i got out and walked and even then the first two races were over. Half England seemed already to have arrived on the hills and to have pitched its wigwams there. The other half was blocking up the road for ten miles back and could not possibly arrive in time for the derby. But the half who had arrived had already set up a city of booths and flags on hill after hill as far as the eye could see. There may have been encampments of this vastness in the days of Xerxes, but surely never since. It was oppressive, overwhelming. There were so many people there that there was no room for anybody. There was no room, so far as I could see, for the man who plays the three-card trick on the top of an open umbrella, or for the man with the tape and pencil. And even the beggars who pray by the roadside for your success were few. There was simply a crush, an enormous, sweltering, and appallingly silent crush. Even the bookmakers seemed to be awed by it. They stood on their stands beside blackboards full of horses' names and mystical figures, but they did not yell at you, hoarsely, bullingly, as bookmakers ought to do. If 
Having looked at the elephantine portrait advertisement of one of them, you wish to bet with him, he will consent in a listless way and say wearily to his clerk, Nine, nine, one, seventy shillings to a dollar, Palumetis, as he handed you a blue, red, and green card. I do not blame him for not being enthusiastic. I am, myself, no longer enthusiastic about Palumetis. Still, one wished for a little violence, besides the violence of the sun, and of the man who tried to sell you a shilling's worth of sausage, and who said he was the only firm, the only firm in the place. Camden Town on a Saturday night could give points to Derby Day for color and uproar. Derby Day is so big, perhaps, that it is frightened of itself. But I forgot. There was one violent man. He was fat, hatless, and sweating, and he was hoarse, with shouting superlatives about his tips to a circle of poor old men, dunches in caps, small boys in jerseys, and tired-looking country girls. If only I could tell you where I got my information, he declared. You'd, you'd be surprised. If any of you has got 25 pound about them, if you've got even a tenner, why, you've only got 10 bob. Well, you can't exactly have a gamble for ten bob, but you can have a bit of fun anyway. If you take my advice, it's here on this bit of paper. You can have it for a bob. I can give you three horses, and that'll turn your ten bob into a tenner, see? Some people tell you Tetra Tema's going to win. He made a face of disgust, popularly known as giving Tetra Tema the raspberry. Don't you believe it? Didn't I tell you, Tag Rag? Didn't I tell you, every arm? Here, take my tip, and you'll dance all the way home with joy tonight. Dance while you'll go home jazzing all the way. And he spread out his fat hands and threw out his fat stomach and danced on the grass, just to show one how one ought to behave if one backed the derby winner. Meanwhile, his partner, dressed as a red and white jockey in a peak cap and incongruous putties, moved around the circle, thrusting his slips of tips almost angrily on us. Go on, he ordered us. What's a bob to a gambler? You people read the papers and believe what you see in them. The papers? I tell you straight, the worst pack of rogues and bookmakers in England. A simple old man of ninety who had lost his teeth beckoned to him and paid him a shilling for his tip. The jockey took him aside and whispered impressively into his ear. Then he said in a loud voice, Are you satisfied, sir? Quite satisfied, quavered the old man. I wish I could have stayed near him. I should have liked to have seen him jazzing later in the evening. Sausages, lemonade, fried fish, chewing gum, Bets, ladies standing on the roofs of taxis, a try-your-strength machine, extemporized conveniences of civilization, with youths standing by them and yelling, Commodation! Hills of humanity in all attitudes of dazedness and despair, the thunder and the shouting of the distant bookmakers under the stands, the quiet of the 10,000 freelance bookmakers who were, I suppose, breaking the law in the open spaces, the dust, the sun, the smell, faces smeary with fruit, the cunning tinker in an old khaki hat with striped ribbon who was selling some two-penny instrument that was supposed to imitate either the bark of a dog or the song of a nightingale. One could not tell which from the noise he made with it. Stand after stand, packed to the sky with what are called serried ranks of human beings who looked like immense banks of many-colored shingle and who, as they raised a million pairs of field glasses to two million eyes, scintillated in the distance like a bank of shingle after a wave has broken on it on a tropical noon. It certainly was an amazing medley of spectacle and a door. It is said that an important horse race took place. It is even said that Palumetis ran in it. I looked for him everywhere, over people's heads, under people's heads, through motor buses, round the corners of refreshment tents, in the sky above, and on the earth beneath. But no Palometus was to be seen anywhere, except on my race card. 
where I read about his lilac-colored jockey. A jockey in lilac? How beautiful, how Japanese. And, indeed, all the jockeys, as they paraded down the field before the race, seemed to have robbed a rainbow. They brought meaning and beauty into an otherwise bald and unconvincing mob. I assure you, I love horse racing, if I could see it. But of all the people who congregated the little crooked hills of Epsom, I doubt if ten people in a hundred saw it. You knew the horses had started only because, as you lay dreaming, the million people on the stands suddenly made you jump with a loud, sharp, and terrifying bark, which said, They're off, in one syllable. Then there was deep silence, and somebody near me said, The favorite can't be leading, or they would be shouting. Then from the stands came a murmur like bees, a muttering as of a man talking in his sleep, a growling as of a wind in a cave. This only served to intensify the silence of a defeated people. One knew that something awful must be happening. Perhaps even Palu Metis was winning. Above the heads of the crowd, the heads of the jockeys began to be visible. A fool cried out, The favorite wins! Another, Allen by has it. Then one had a glimpse of three horses close, well, fairly close on each other's tails, and none of them the gray tetratema. I noticed that on one of them crouched a jockey in exquisite grass green. He passed like a fine phrase out of a poem of which one does not know the rest. But I did not really know who had won until the numbers were put up on the board. Then a badly shaven man in a bowler cried, Spion Cup has won! Bravo! and clapped his friend on the back. The rest of us looked at him with contempt. The tinker-nosed man who played the instrument that sang like a dog or barked like a nightingale began to squeak it into people's ears. The crowd began pouring itself through itself, and the dust from its feet rose like a cloud till it was difficult to see across the course. And the motor car broke down on the way home, and Palometus didn't win, and I'm as tired as a dog, and so say all of us. End of chapter 25 Recording by Monica Washington, Atlanta Chapter 26 of The Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. This Blasted World Everything has begun to have a blasted look till the sun shines. The ferns have been beaten down by the wind and the rain, and lie withered and broken-backed among the brambles waiting till some poor man thinks it worth his while to go off with a load of them on his back for bedding the brambles too all hoops and arches have the air of dying things though white blossoms still continue to appear and the fruit is not yet all ripened and many of the leaves are as red and bright as flowers the edges of most of the leaves have begun to crumble they are victims of a creeping sickness that eats into them and dirties them and makes bramble and fern together an inextricable wilderness of refuse this however is only if one looks too closely the hill that loses itself among the rocks on the seashore is capped and patched with just such refuse as this but how happily the rust color of dying things is broken by the gray of the loose stone walls hedges they call them in cornwall that seem to totter up the hill like old men the mist of rain that leaves each individual plant bedraggled seems to make the red and green and gray pattern of the patched hill only more beautiful and mysterious the truth is winter speaks with two voices even in these early days she has one voice that sends cold shivers down our backs she has another voice that is refreshment like water from a spring she speaks with the first voice in the crooked trees in the summer they were cloaked and glorious. Now, when their cloaks seem so much more necessary, they are left naked, poor creatures, their backs to the sea wind, with the air of runaways unable to escape. They seem bent and poised for flight, 
but when a blast of wind comes and tugs at them they are as the stump of a tooth that will not move and the leaves such of them as are left which in summer made a music as pleasant as that of wind bells rattle in their branches like the laughter of a skeleton the oak and the thorn bush could scarcely writhe more if they were crippled by rheumatism every leaf on the sycamore is spotted as if with some foul black acid here too however as soon as the leaves have fallen the world is restored to cheerfulness the withering tree seems a sufferer the fallen leaf is an imp an adventurer as the wind sweeps round a bend in the road leaf after leaf is up and performing cartwheels down the road as if christmas day had come thousands of them borne along in a dance of this kind advanced with the beflustered orderly air of a procession of starlings the world ceases to be a universal grave it is at the very least a dance and a dust storm there are some days no doubt on which the chill damp in the air seems to terrify almost every living thing into hiding and the stillness of the dead world is not disturbed by any bird or insect even the jackdaws have mysteriously disappeared like melted snow but no sooner does the storm in the sky break up into floating islands of cloud and the sun shine than all the world begins to glitter again bramble and ivy and stone and a host of tiny and coloured creatures resume their game of an infinite general post in the bright air the ivy especially is a little continent of life wherever it grows clambering over a wall or climbing up among the sloes in a blackthorn it attracts bee and wasp and fly blue fly and gray fly and green fly to graze on the pollen of its late flowers the ivy is the last of the plants to flower and insects come to it as from the ends of the earth in rejoicing myriads among the berries in the hedges the birds too rejoice the robin though for the most part i believe a meat-eater becomes unambiguously happy at this time of year he has usurped the morning and while one is lying in bed he is boasting in the trees outside where the thrush and the blackbird will in a few months be boasting with their scarcely more beautiful voices i am half persuaded that his song becomes different at this season as he sits and sways on the top of a cypress and looks down on a rich and eatable world he seems to have cast every note of pensive sadness out of his being and to sing aloud the rapture of a happy stomach he is no longer the singer of elegy but of ecstasy he is as unlike his old simple friendly appealing pathetic self as a beggar who has come into a fortune he actually swaggers and as he does so he can fill a garden or a wood at the end of october with the pleasure of spring the large titmouse in its dark cap and the blue tit almost too pretty for an english winter in its blue and yellow coat also hasten to the feast of the berries i do not know whether under the iron rain of high prices people have ceased to hang out cocoa-nuts in their gardens for the blue tits at present fortunately the berries are abundant and it is pleasant to see a tit venture to the edge of the road in quest of one and then fly off into hiding like a thief with a red ball in his beak a scarcely less pretty bird than one sees flying across the road now and then with cries of alarm is the gray wagtail the gray wagtail you probably know is the wagtail that is not gray as it struggles and shrills through the sunny air it seems a delight mainly of yellow both its cries and its flight make one think that it lives in constant terror of falling it proceeds through the air in a series of efforts and ups and downs and its long tail seems perpetually to threaten to misguide it into collapse down among the rocks and in the fields near them the real gray wagtails abound the pied wagtails as they are called with their white cheeks and their less hysterical voices that greet one in passing with a pleasant little cheerio as they alight from the air beside a puddle they indulge in a little prance as though they were trying to cut a figure of eight or nothing or were essaying in some manner to sweep their tails out of way their whole existence however is a dance whether they pick their food from the rocks or in a field of cows the alert head and jerking tail are never still but are nervously ready for flight almost before the hint of danger 
and they have usually with them as nervous companions the rock pipits charming little tight-skinned low-crowned birds that hurry off wavily through the air reiterating their solitary note of fear as they fly the starlings which seem to disappear for a time have now returned to the fields near the sea they have left their wonderful sheen somewhere behind them and are mottled and plebeian still to see a cloud of them alighting in a field at the end of a swift circle of flight is a pretty enough spectacle the evolutions of cavalry and still more of aeroplanes are elementary compared to this close packed as they are a thousand of them will wheel in order without an accident and alight each on his own patch of ground with the easy grace of acrobats it is only when they have found their feet that the disorder begins whether it is worms or insects or verdure they seek among the grazing cows there is evidently little enough to go around and starling fights starling with peck and protest all over the field it is a scene of civil war save that the birds do not form themselves into sides but each wrestles with its neighbor at random but after all they are very hungry they cluster ravenously on the green patches even on the sides of the old stone walls they have evidently not had the economic question settled for them as the cows have luckily other birds are either less desperate or more pacific by nature the stone chat as he flits from bramble to bramble in his black cap white collar and red bib is a bird of charming behavior as well as of charming color there is nothing in him to discord with these rainbow days for stormy as they are the days are rainbow days to an astonishing extent seldom have i seen such a violence of rainbows the colors almost startle one like a courting apes every passing shower builds an arch of the seven colors like a palace on the sea then it draws near till the foot of the rainbow stands a few yards below over the breaking waves seabirds sail through it and if a pot of gold is really to be found at the end of it i must often lately have been within touching distance of a fortune at night jupiter it is jupiter is it not that hangs in the v of aldebaran about eight or nine in the evening just now stills the world to wonder as the rainbow does by day he is so splendid a fire as to seem almost solitary even when the moon is shining a few evenings ago he shed a path of light over the sea as the moon does and seemed to light up the sands on the far side of the bay it is undoubtedly a blasted world but what a beautiful blasted world it is a pity that we and the starlings are so belly-driven that we cannot settle down and enjoy it peck peck my worm i think peck 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 end of chapter twenty six end of the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind